You're all joining palms. And repeat after me. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. Keeping the palms joined. All right, good morning, everybody. Good to see you all here. Thank you for being here. Anyone here for the first time? Oh, hiding all the way in the back? Welcome. What brings you here? Okay. There's a glare, so all I saw was like a finger pointing, but... Uh, were you like bribed or what happened? Right on. So you came on your own volition. That's good. Well, it's only an hour. And if you feel the need to run out screaming prior to the hour, feel free. Welcome. What brings you here? A friend. Also a, friend. a friend. Those friends, man, they make life real difficult for us. <laughs> It's funny because introducing people to like meditation or Buddhist stuff or whether you're brand new to it or not is always, always a interesting uh, journey because, you know, if you think back for each one of us, when you started this path, meditation, learning about Buddhism, whatever it was, there was probably a time in your life where you were like, yeah, not so much, you know, and then we reach a place where we realize whatever other things we're turning to for stress or anxiety or anger or sadness or depression or whatever it is doesn't always work so well so we find ourselves somehow settling into this practice and uh initially it's really difficult you know um it's not easy at first who's found it difficult especially if you're newer to it i saw a couple hands you want to share why um because you have to sit with yourself without distraction. Yeah, you have to sit with yourself without distraction. And how fun is it to sit with ourselves? Who else? I saw a bunch of hands. Someone over here. It's a difficult. Yeah, Eric. Welcome back. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess conditioning our minds to behave a certain way. No, conditioning our minds to behave a certain way is not an easy process. And uh, it's a lot of unlearning of the way we've been doing things our whole lives. And that's challenging. Uh, what else? Who else? Why? It's, yeah. Uh, I got a lot of bad advice. <laughs> you got a lot of bad advice? Yeah. I told you to stop listening to me years oh, ago. No, no, this was, this was before I got your bad advice. Okay. <laughs> Well, hopefully my bad advice was better than the last bad advice. So far, so good. Awesome. Yeah. Um, okay, what was the bad advice you got? I was <laughs> debating on whether or not I was going to ask you. I, know, I think that um, a lot of the people, because I, you know, I'm a little high strung, so you know, people feel the need to tell me I should try to meditate. Um, 
But I think that like people have different ideas about what the goal of meditation is. And just sitting with yourself was never one of the things that they mentioned. <laughs> right. Um, you know, there's this whole kind of you know, transcendence or getting out of your head or quieting your mind. And quieting your mind outside of the context of learning how to sit with yourself doesn't make a lot of sense. Right. So. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, and for those who might be new or newer to practice, that is a very common, what I'd consider, misconception. And, uh, you know, as I say often, if a thousand people lead you in meditation, they'll lead you a thousand different ways. And it's not necessarily that any of them are right or wrong or good or bad. They're just different approaches. But this approach really is learning to sit with yourself. And whatever all of that madness is in your head, that's there. And it's not going to go away overnight just because you did some meditation practice, right? And if you're 50 years old and you got a lot of madness in your head, that means it's been there a long time or whatever age you are, it's been there. And uh, learning to be with that is, is very difficult, um, but also incredibly important. Uh, one more who wants to share why it's difficult. Yeah, Chuck. I think what's kind of what you just said, I'm still learning. Still learning. Right. <clears throat> I think it's going to be a long time. It's going to be a long time. Yeah. Um, yeah, recently there was uh, somebody who um, I, I made, and it's a comment or kind of a comment and a bit of sarcasm and joke, but also truth. Uh, I referenced to somebody recently. I said, you know, that's great. You've had that awareness. Now continue that because it's going to take you about seven years. And that was the number that just popped into my head. And they didn't like that response. Right. And that's because, well, I can't speak to why they didn't like the response, but very often a response like that comes from a place of thinking like, well, no, I'm doing this now. So I want it to work now. We're conditioned to have things fixed or healed or corrected or changed. Instant gratification, instant um, enjoyment. And, and uh, we don't often like things that take time. So... Uh, this practice, it is. It's something that will take time. Um, but as long as you're patient, which I know everyone in this room is, you'll you'll be fine. So, uh, and to all of our YouTube followers, good morning to you as well. Uh, thanks for uh, being here. Feel free to say hello, introduce yourself to the other folks online there. And uh, when we get to questions, I'll be happy to do my best to respond to you as well. Um, so we'll start with the meditation practice. Uh, a couple things I'll tell you before we begin. Uh, nothing's going to happen to you. You're not going to float away. Uh, you won't have any mystical, magical experiences. The mind that races all day long is not going to shut off. Don't judge your practice. I mean, you don't ask yourself, is this working or not working? Are you doing it right or wrong? Uh, we're just going to sit and breathe. You'll hear sounds, sounds inside the room, sounds outside. Uh, this is life. Life is filled with chaos, and this practice is learning to get quiet and still within all of the chaos. Uh, posture, you just want to be comfortable. If you are in a cushion, just slide into the front third often helps. Uh, benches or chairs also pushing the stomach forward allows the back to straighten. Shoulders are relaxed. Hands can be on the knees or in the lap, whatever's comfortable. If you need to move, simply move. Scratching your leg or arm doesn't make you a bad meditator. It just means you have an itch. And as a reminder, you won't think nothing. You're not trying to shut off your mind. You're just going to be aware of it. And I'll say things periodically to remind you to come back to present moment. I'll guide us as we begin, and then we'll settle into a little bit of silence. And starting with the eyes closed, if comfortable, or slightly open. Mouth is open or closed. We'll 
We'll start with taking three deep breaths, slowly. And eventually, we'll settle into a natural rhythm of the breath. Noticing the mind as it wanders, jumping from thought to thought. We'll start with gently guiding the attention, focus to the stomach or chest. <coughs> Breathing in, feel them rise. Breathing out, they fall. Simply continue this practice. Observing sensation of breath. As the mind wanders, lost in thought, recognize it. Release that thought. Return attention, focus to the breath.
Where's your mind? Lost in thought. Return to breath. Letting go of expectations. Letting go of judgments from the practice. Just sitting. Breathing.
keeping the mind alert. Aware of each sound. Each thought Each physical sensation. yet concerned with nothing but sitting, breathing, And with the body still, rested, and the speech quiet, aware of all sounds, and the mind learning to settle.
know what it's like to just sit and breathe. Knowing with each breath, there's nothing else to do. Nowhere else to go. No one else to be. Everything beautiful, exactly as it is. Sitting, breathing. Once again, taking three deep breaths, slowly. As you slowly open the eyes, slowly beginning to move. And most important, with the practice of meditation, is to recognize how you feel now, immediately after. Compare this to how you typically feel throughout your day, recognize the difference, if there is one, and ask yourselves how you'd prefer to feel every day for the rest of your life, and realize however you feel now, if it's quiet, calm, and still, or a busy mind, racing mind, whatever you're sitting with at this moment has nothing to do with anything I said. It's nothing to do with how we sit, hold the hands or cross the legs. It's nothing to do with the sounds around us or anything else for that matter. It has everything to do with your own mind and your own mind's reaction to an external condition. This is what the Buddha called Pratitya Samupata, means dependent origination. This is the basis of the Buddha's awakening. The word Buddha simply means awakened. He was a human being, no different than any one of us, who began to understand why he suffered, why he got angry, sad, depressed, stressed, anxious. He began to understand the cause and relationship of all phenomena. And what that means, very simply for all of us, regardless of where we come from or what we 
believe in and where we think we're going. Our whole life is filled with things that happen and we react. More stuff happens, more reactions. That's it. This practice is learning what it's like to respond to something quietly, peacefully, still. Because for most of us, the way you responded to the last 20 minutes is quite different from how you respond to everything else that's happening throughout your day. So all we're working on is closing the gap to where the way you feel now is closer to how you feel always. Just as driven, motivated, productive, successful. Whatever that means to you in your respective lives. But with a mind that's steady, clear, focused, distracted by nothing, disturbed by no one. It's not an easy practice. It's not necessarily fun. It's not an escape, as was alluded to earlier. It's direct perception into the present moment. And very often that present moment is incredibly difficult. So it's learning to be with things as they are, which has been very difficult for most people our entire lives. We spend much of our lives escaping or running away from the way things are. And that as one example is why this practice is difficult because it's not the escape. It challenges us to be with life as it is. Meditation is free. Buddhist practice is free. It's sitting, breathing, learning to be kind to yourself and everybody else. Which is why it's so easy because you just have to go be nice to everybody. So kind of wasting your time since you all figured that out already. Once we stop trying to change, fix, control, manipulate everything outside of us, and we work on our mind and our reaction to the world around us, life gets simpler. But this requires us to drop a lot of what our ego and sense of self have been holding on to for a very long time. It challenges us to open up our minds and our hearts to the possibility that everything we think and say and do might not always be correct. And that's really difficult because most of us don't want to roam around all day thinking that our thoughts and our words and actions might not be correct. <laughs> In fact, we spent our whole life building that our views, kind of what we want to put our foot down or stand on. And this asks us to challenge that, to challenge our attachment to our views, to let go of some of these perceptions we've had of not just the world around us, but also ourselves. Because very often we can get stuck in the story of ourselves. And very often we've been telling ourselves the same story for years and years and years. And that identity, that story, that label that we're putting ourselves is like 20 years old. But we're still stuck there. Everyone in this room has gone through a lot. A lot of stress, a lot of chaos, a lot of trauma, a lot of experiences that have shaped us to who we are in this very moment. And uh, once in a while, don't be afraid to pat yourself on the back and say, hey, I'm okay. I'm here. I'm alive. I'm breathing. And uh, I have an opportunity to continue to practice. So uh, with that, I'll pause. Uh, for me, I really prefer to respond to questions, uh, meditation, Buddhist practice, um, anything that you're sitting with. Um, and we use the rest of our brief time this morning for that. Uh, and again, welcome to all our YouTube folks. Um, good morning. Uh, feel free to 
type in any question there you want. I'll do my best to respond to that as well. Yeah, Al. Oh. I'm reading the biography of the Buddha again. Uh, my friend Q and each author has their own take, but basically yeah. they're very similar. And I still have trouble. I may have even asked this question a year or two ago, but it's still when I get to the part where he just ups and leaves his family. I talk about kindness. That is not kindness. Yeah. I let you finish, but I. I've been sitting without for years and I almost cut you off and I was going to finish your question because I knew the question you were going to ask. And yes, you've asked that many times. And yes, you're a father. And yes, you can't even imagine bailing. All right. Well, the example of kindness, that is the opposite. Yeah. That's very selfish. To yeah. Me. And at that time, he was not awakened. He was not what we call the Buddha. He was, well, even when he became called the Buddha, he was a regular dude, but he was just a regular dude. And he suffered, and he was lost, and he was confused, and uh, wanted to figure out how to liberate from the cycle of birth and death. Now, this is one key element that's really difficult for people that grew up in a culture, which is for the most part, just about everyone in this room, unless I'm mistaken, maybe one or two of us grew up in a culture where we were raised to believe. Was anyone here raised to believe in rebirth or reincarnation? No, one. Okay. <laughs> so most of us were not raised with the idea that rebirth is a thing. A reincarnation is a thing. At that time, and I'm going to start with this and I'm going to back up, but to put this really into context, you have to understand that that's what they were taught, is that they're going to be continuously reborn and with birth will come suffering. And that the only way to liberate from suffering was to free yourself from the cycle of birth and death. That's what they believed. We can't grasp that, most, most people in this culture. It doesn't make sense to us. It sounds like some weird thing that they believed a long time ago. But I'll tell you what, the thing that most Western people believe today would have been completely bizarre to them at that time. India, 2,500 years ago, if you told people, hey, you got one life and this is it, buddy, they'd be like, what? You're nuts. No, we're going to be reborn endlessly on the wheel of samsara, the cycle of birth and death, until we free ourselves from the cycle of birth and death. That's what was taught. Everybody believed that. That was the Hindu belief, the Hindu religion. And the practice was to free yourself from that. So I'll back up to the actual point that you're asking about, but I just want to take this approach with you or for everybody really to understand that the mindset at people or of people at that time was not, this is my husband, this is my wife, these are my children, and that's it. The mindset was, this is my life, this life. And that in the past, I had other lives, other wives, other husbands, other children, other mothers, other fathers, other sisters, other brothers, other, other it's just endless. And in the future, it's going to be the same. Endless. Everybody believed that. So when you look at, and to back up for those who might not know, uh, when the Buddha was 29 with a wife, with a child, as a prince, which he was, and he snuck out in the middle of the night, he saw the four sights. It's known in Buddhism. He saw old age, sickness, death, and an ascetic. A very simple, like a monk or nun, wise person. And he went to his buddy, Chana, and he said, what's this old age sickness and death stuff? Because it was predicted when Siddhartha was born that he was either going to be a great king or like a Buddha. And so the father wanted him to be a king. So he protected him. They knew as a child he had so much compassion. I talked about this last week where they were killing the birds, shooting, a, a, you know, like a... 
slingshots at the birds and the bird fell to the ground and he saw the bird in pain. He was like eight or 10 years old as a child. And this like burst of compassion came out in him as a child because of the harm he brought to this bird. So he was such this like compassion flowing through this dude, but his father wanted him to be a king and rule and kill. So they sheltered him. Anytime anyone in the palace got old or sick or anytime anything like a flower wilted or died, they removed it. They never wanted him to see that those things existed because they knew he wouldn't stay. And then at 29 years old, he sees all these things. He comes back and he says, I can't live like this, spoiled with all the wealth, all the riches, all the everything. When I know there's a world of suffering, and I know that we're going to endlessly continue to be reborn into a world where we're going to suffer. He wanted to figure out how to help people from being reborn. That was what he wanted. The reason that most people can't grasp what he did is because we can't grasp that we're going to be reborn. We think this is my life and that's it. But what he realized was that people, his wife, his children, his birth mother, his mother died at birth. His aunt raised him. His mother died giving birth to him. They say that was the first moment that he felt that sense of loss because his, his mother died at birth when, when he was born. But so when he left, he kissed his wife, he kissed his child and he left. And that's the part that people kind of single out. And I get it. I'm not a fan of leaving your wife or child. I'm not saying, yay, do that. <laughs> but I'm trying to put in a context what was going on at that time. Right? This is not like a green light to just go home to your family and be like, yo, peace out. I went to my Buddhist thing. I'm out of here. That's not the message. He wanted to figure out, knowing at that time that his wife would continuously be reborn and suffer. His child would continuously be reborn and suffer. And he wanted to figure out how to end that cycle. So he roamed the base of the Himalayan mountains for six years and studied and practiced and figured out why we suffer. And then spent the next 45 years teaching. We suffer because of greed, anger, ignorance. We lack compassion, generosity, wisdom. And if we work on these things, we can neutralize our karma and enter into nirvana and not be reborn where we're going to suffer. So he came back at 35 years old. They, that's the teaching you've heard me say this a million times. He taught the Four Noble Truths, that image up there above the exit sign, the first five guys who saw him teaching. And they were like, there's Siddhartha. Not there's the Buddha, there's Siddhartha. There's the guy. He looks like he's figured something out. Let's sit with him. He taught them the Four Noble Truths. Life is suffering, the cause of suffering, the ending of suffering and the path. And they said, we will call you the Buddha, which was just a word that meant awakened. So they viewed him as an awakened being. And as I just said, he taught for 45 years and he died at 80. But when he came back after 30, you know, after awakening, he came back to wife, he came back to child, he came back to family. They all became monks and nuns. Um, and, you know, I don't know what's in anyone's mind or heart sitting in this room. So I'm not going to pretend to know what was in Siddhartha's mind or heart 2,500 years ago. But my guess is somebody that lived the life that he lived, his purpose was to heal people from suffering. And that's the journey he had to go on to then come back and teach people how to end their suffering. And I find that really beautiful. Again, I'm not a fan of like bailing on your spouse, your partner, your child. But I look at what was his intention. Yeah. Um, the, the commentaries also talk about he and his wife had all these riches. They had all these, they could do anything they could possibly want. And yet they couldn't stop aging, illness, and death. And he... His wife knew what he was doing. It wasn't like a. It wasn't like he middle of the night for you guys. I'm out of here. Yeah. Um, it was a. It was an, an inevitable path. So it was a spiritual journey that he had shared with his wife that he was going to take. Yeah. yeah. 
And so what uh, Jonathan's talking about is there's what's called the sutras, which are the teachings, the, is the sastra, the commentary. So in the Pali Canon, you have the sutras, which are the teachings, the sastra, which are the commentaries on the teachings. And then you have the Vinaya, which is the code of conduct, the moral ethical behavior is taught by the Buddha. So what he's referencing is the sastras, the commentaries on the sutras. So um, completely different context from just this idea of like leaving. Yeah. Um, I think that, like, I myself have had to leave my children, um, and I, 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 maybe from the outside, it did not look like the kind thing to do. Yeah. But ultimately, that was the kind thing to do, and I happened to be reunited, and everything worked out differently. But I've known a lot of people who've had to leave their children. Yeah. And so it's not. Um, <clears throat> I, I guess under certain circumstances, it would be, you know, I mean, I also know people who just Sure, did. sure, you know? yeah. And so it's not, that's, I think that this, the context of this is very different. Yeah. So it's, it's hard to imagine if you're the caring person who's competent and capable stepping away. For sure. But if you have something um, that ultimately is going to bring back something better in the lives of the children. Right. <laughs> Stepping away is the right thing to do. Right, and I think that's back to kind of Jonathan's example for those who maybe didn't hear it in the back, or mm -hmm. is that they recognize him and his wife that they had the wealth, the riches, they had the material possessions, they had everything they could to the means to support, but what they couldn't do was stop old age, sickness, and death. And that's what they wanted to try to figure out. And again, at that time, that's what the practice was about, was to free yourself from being reborn and, and also never understanding um, the reasons or never knowing really the reasons that anybody does anything. And uh, I think it does come down to the intention. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Just kind of a thought, uh, trailing off on that, which is, it's also a, uh, a migrant story, right? Like, I think of, I have a, a dear friend of mine who was my tailor, and he left his family in Vietnam for 11 years before he could bring them here. And, you know, the history is filled with people leaving their families to create a better life, and I think that's really yeah. what this story is about. Yeah. Yeah, I've never viewed it as a, um, a, a, like, a running away from responsibility type of thing. Um, I've always viewed the different pieces I've read about him going on his journey um, as a way to really make life better. And a very tough choice for him. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I have a more specific to meditation question. Sure. And it's like a physical question when you're meditating. I sometimes get this like feeling of like unbalanced or dizzy or like I'm sweating. Yeah. Do you know, is that like, is that happening? <laughs> or is it just. That means you've attained, like you're like right there. <laughs> Somebody got there today, you know. Um, I don't know. You know, here's what I'll share with you. So the question for those, just to repeat, is when you're meditating, you're saying sometimes you get like a, either a dizziness or a swaying kind of feeling, right? Um, so question, your eyes are closed, you're meditating, right? Okay, so here's my suggestion. Eyes open. Now, for me, as a with the Zen practice very specifically, it's an eyes open meditation practice. So when I'm leading you all here, my eyes are open. I mean, I'm, I'm not like staring at you all, but my eyes are not closed. And in a very practical way of looking at this, how do you live your life throughout your day? Eyes open or closed? 
when you're not sleeping? Eyes open, right? And if the practice of meditation is learning not to be good at meditation, but to cultivate a sense of calm and settled and, you know, um, you know, the peaceful, easy feeling uh, for you Eagles fans, um, <laughs> then it helps for me to recognize, OK, well, I want to learn to do this with my eyes open so that when I'm out there in my life, I can have that same way about me. Often when we close our eyes, and this isn't addressing your question at all, because I honestly don't know, <laughs> but I'm giving you another practice to try that might probably cut through this. Often when we close our eyes, all kinds of things happen, right? We feel dizzy. We feel off, you know, unbalanced. We daydream, you know, we get lost in la-la land. We fall asleep, right? All kinds of things happen. Um, when your eyes are open, you're just sitting there staring at the ground. And so the practice, and you can all try this with me. So close your eyes. And then as you open them, open them just to where you can start to see and to where you're gazing off the edge of the nose, not at your nose, you'll get dizzy, but about a foot to two feet in front of you at the ground or at the chair or whatever's in front of you. So your eyes are open and you're gazing down at one spot. So if I were to look at you, like right now I'm looking at you, it looks like your eyes are closed, but they're actually open, right? I'll take that as a yes. Um, did you did you see the difference there? So my suggestion is next time you do meditation or the next few times, try that way. Because that will just, to me, bring you to present moment. Like here I am sitting, looking at this little spot on the wood table. That's it. Thoughts will still come and go. Ideas will still come and go. Um, sensations will still come and go. But maybe that kind of unbalanced feeling you're talking about, um, you know, might go away. Does that help? Yeah, it's a good thing to try. Yeah. I did want to add sometimes I zone out so hard to stop breathing and that will make me dizzy. So add that experience. Yeah, I always recommend to continue breathing. <laughs> um, it, it tends to make the practice easier. So, yeah, for sure. And kind of like I alluded to earlier, you know, it's good to try if you're all used to just doing eyes closed, then try an eyes open meditation, see how that feels for you. And it doesn't mean one is better or worse. It's just different ways to experience meditation. Uh, but when we can cut through this idea that meditation means something that's supposed to happen to us, or that we're supposed to have some big like aha moments, you're just learning to be with life as it is. That in itself is pretty magical. So, what else? Thoughts, questions? Um, back to that other topic, I'm left with a little bit of discouragement because um, it's been 2,500 years and we still are suffering yeah. with um, disease, old age, and especially death. Some people might um, avoid, the, avoid the first two. But yeah. So we're, we haven't really progressed very much. It's a little well, no. Uh, so uh, you're, you're um, at the risk of saying this and sounding rude, you're missing the point. <laughs> I've known you long enough. To, I didn't know how else to say that, right? If you were brand new, I would have found a gentler way. But the point is that as long as you are alive, which last I checked, you're alive. You are going to age. You are going to get sick. You are going to die. As you're living your life, that's just what happens. The purpose is not to figure out, and that may be my fault for being a little unclear with that, but what the Buddha taught, which was a way of how things were at that time, is that as you are born, that's what we all get. So I'm not suggesting that you figure out now while you're alive how to stop aging, stop sickness, and stop death. It's, it cannot be stopped. It's how you live. Yeah. It's, yes, it's how you live, but the point of what the Buddha was teaching was that the only way to escape aging, sickness, and death is to no longer be born. 
we're already born. So don't try to stop aging and sickness and death. Right. And so that's where I might have been unclear, not just for you, but for anybody. So I appreciate bringing it up. Like when you say discouraged as Buddhists, we're not like waking up and thinking, OK, how am I going to end my aging? How am I going to end my sickness, whether it's physical, mental, emotional sickness? At some point in time, this body will stop working. And then I will die. That's guaranteed. 100%. As soon as I am born, that's what I get. I get aging, not even old age. I get aging. I get sickness. I get death. That's just life. So we're not trying to stop those things. We're trying to respond to that in a gentle, kind manner and experience lots of beautiful moments throughout your day. And live with less greed, less anger, less ignorance, less pride, less ego. And again, I don't, to me, it's never about trying to convince people to rebirth or reincarnation. It's completely irrelevant. But in this context, all the Buddha was saying was the only way to stop that is to get off of the wheel of rebirth. That's what he was saying. No one here came here, you didn't come here because you want to stop rebirth. You didn't wake up today and say, like, I'm going to go to the temple today because I don't want to be reborn. <laughs> I would like to. You'd like to, yes, but, you know. <laughs> but that's the idea. So does that make more sense? Yeah, I get it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so my fault if I misled you all in thinking that, you know, the goal is to stop that while you're alive. Um but I think the most important part of this message, really, and, and you kind of mentioned it, I think, there briefly, is it's not about the aging, the sickness, and the death. It's about us being alive and how are we living our life? How are we responding to aging and sickness and loss and death and things like that? And if we can do that with the kind and gentle heart, then... It makes all this time that we're alive more pleasant and more enjoyable. But if we carry anger and hatred and resentment and guilt and shame and all these things that we tend to carry in our lives, um, it can make being alive miserable. And, uh, you know, this is a very beautiful, precious gift we have, this human life. Um, so don't waste any of it being miserable. The clock is ticking, folks, you know. So enjoy your moments because we don't know how many we'll get. So, yeah. All right. So with that, we'll close. Um, we'll join palms. We'll do a transfer of merit. Many merit gained from this practice be transferred to all beings in all directions. May the merit gained be transferred to the 6 million lives that have been lost during this pandemic and their family and friends who continue to suffer during this time. And to all of those in Ukraine and surrounding areas who suffer at this time, may they all be at peace. May we all be at peace and free from suffering. So uh, a few quick announcements. Um, thanks all for being here. Uh, my name is Jeff. I'm a Dharma bum. Uh, we opened up this temple 15 years ago to introduce Buddhist practice to those who show up. Uh, those of us who lead, we're not monks, we're not nuns, we're not gurus, we're not masters, we're not teachers, we're not looking for students. Uh, we're just practitioners. We do our best to take our understanding of the Buddhist teachings and put it into terms that hopefully make sense to those who show up. Um, just about every night we have different practices going on, different people leading from different Buddhist traditions. A um, couple things that have returned. Our family Sangha is back. We met a couple weeks ago for the first time, um, which is a beautiful group with parents and kids and toddlers. And we have a teen group that will start up in the fall. Um, but that right now is the uh, third Saturday of the month um, through the summer. And then it will go back to being twice a month. So that's on the website. Um, you do need to RSVP for that just so we can not have like 30 toddlers running around the temple. Um, actually, that would be great. We just need people watching them. So uh, 
and also the day of silence retreat um, that is back as well that will return to being the first saturday of the month which is coming up in june uh, that also we are doing an rsvp because that's capped as well at about 15 people for right now um, so other than that just grateful to see you all after being closed for 18 months which was miserable it's nice to be open we still appreciate y'all wearing masks and um, doing our best to keep everybody here safe um, as, as much as everybody loves and wishes that this pandemic was over and done um, it's not and things are getting worse in san diego so um, we're going to continue to stay cautious and do what we can so we appreciate you um, you know playing along with us as we try to navigate the world we're in right now um, buddha for you same thing was closed 18 months it's open it's downstairs if you need anything that's there um, and uh, Garden Club, Garden Club, Kira is here. Um, if anybody wants to stick around after, and it's something that's really beautiful to learn to really take care of the space that we all use. As I always say, there's no cleaning crew. You know, we are it. Um, so if anybody wants to stick around and garden outside, to sweep outside for five minutes or 20 minutes or an hour or whatever, um, they'll be gathering out front there. And Kira will give you something fun and enlightening to do, um, guaranteed. And uh, yeah, other than that, there's a whole list by the door of stuff. If anybody wants to sweep or clean or anything like that, um, it's always appreciated. So uh, thanks all for being here. Um, be well, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you, YouTube folks.